and welcome to the weekend worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. I'm the Reverend Monica Dobbins. I'm the Assistant Minister of this congregation, and I am delighted that you are tuning in from wherever you are, joining us for this service. If it's your first time tuning in, we are especially glad to have you with us, and we hope you'll make a habit of it. Please visit our website, slcuu.org for more information about our congregation or visit our social media channels to find out more. Even though we aren't meeting in person right now, we have programs for all ages happening virtually, and we want you to be a part of it. As evidence of how busy our congregation is, I want to share with you a couple of brief announcements before we get started. First of all, we know how hard it can be to keep track of all the exciting things going on at our church when we can't be in the building together. So I want to remind you of some of the ways you can stay in touch and keep up with the latest news. First, Friday is the day when the weekly Torch email arrives in your inbox. We're working hard to get all the news that's fit to print into this email. Please also follow us on Facebook or Instagram, and you can even change your settings so you see announcements from the church right at the top of your feed. Finally, you may have received a text message from our church recently. Yes, we're now using text messages to let you know when something important or urgent is coming up. To opt in to text messaging, just text the word JOIN, J-O-I-N, to 833 709-1047, and you can expect no more than two or three texts per month. Anti-Racism 101, time is running out for you to sign up for a class on being an anti-racist led by Reverend Tom. It starts this week on the 9th, and the class is limited to just 20 participants. You'll be studying works by some of the greatest black minds of the past century and today. And we're also gearing up for another year of small group ministry. This year, we'll be working with the nationally acclaimed Soul Matters curriculum with a greater focus on spiritual practice and matters of the heart. Perhaps you've always wanted to participate in the past, but struggled to make time for it with kids and schedules and busy life or maybe getting out after dark was a challenge for you. But now, since we're conducting these meetings primarily over Zoom, this could be your year. And let's face it, who doesn't need more connection right now? You can sign up for both the anti-racism class and a small group ministry at our website, slcuu.org, and you can find more information there. And finally, we are looking for individuals and families in our church to light our virtual chalice for worship each week. Please record a video of yourself and or those who live with you, lighting a chalice in your home and saying those familiar words that we use each week. And then you can send it to me via email or drop it into the Google folder that's linked in your Torch email. We're hoping to get videos from about 40 families so that we have enough videos to feature a different family in our worship each week. And if you submit a video before October 1st, you will be entered to win a $30 bookstore gift card. Just a little incentive to get your camera rolling. And now we join with Unitarian Universalists around the world in lighting our chalice, a sacred flame that represents freedom of religion and the pursuit of peace. I light it today with these words by the Reverend Carl Scovel. Let this message of good news and hope fill your hearts as we begin our worship service. At the heart of all creation lies a good intent, a purposeful goodness, from which we come, by which we live our fullest, to which we shall at last return. And this is the supreme reality of our lives. Neither duty, nor suffering, nor progress, nor conflict, 
Not even survival is the aim of life, but joy, deep, abiding, uncompromised joy. Symbol of light. Symbol of knowledge. Symbol of warmth. Symbol of freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and, and the, the infinite, infinite possibilities, possibilities of, of love. love. Each of us has a basket. Well, for some of us, it may not be a basket. Maybe it's a toolbox or a bucket or a handbag. Regardless, each of us has this invisible container we take with us through our lives. Inside of it, we hold all of our resources for taking care of our spirit. While some of us may have many similar things in our basket, each basket holds our unique resources for us to pull from. These are resources we use every day in all different kinds of ways. We use them when we're feeling mellow and when we're feeling a lot of stress. The resources in our baskets ground us to the earth, to each other, and most importantly, to ourselves. I heard a few years ago that what makes these resources or spiritual practices unique is the intention you put into your attention. It's the active intention you're putting your attention towards, whatever that may be. In some people's baskets, you may find singing. For some, it's yoga or maybe being outside. For others, it's social justice issues. In March, when the awareness of the pandemic started and we all began staying at home, I decided pretty quickly that I needed to double down on my own resources or spiritual practices. I began journaling every day with a focus on gratitude. I began meditating to find quiet in my own anxiety and I began gardening. Gardening has given me more than I imagined when I began in the spring. It's given me a physical connection to the earth. I sit with my hands in dirt, feeling the soil. Is it too dry or too wet? I don't have a drip system, so I'm often out there watering with my hose, again, in the quiet, usually to a set time. In my garden, I am creating food for my family to nourish our bodies. That food is usually eaten at meals together, further grounding my spirit in the connection of my family. Now, as we begin this worship service, I encourage you to start thinking about what's inside your basket or what you want to put in there. May it be so. Warm greetings to all of you, and thank you for joining us in our worship service today. In our brief time together where we have a chance to meditate and reflect, I'd like to begin with perhaps an unusual question. I want to ask you, where, where is your stress level at right now? Where's it been for the last while? Don't run away from that question. I'm not being nosy or anything like that. I'm just asking you to kind of check in with yourself. Where's your stress level? It's an important consideration. And I say that because in all the reports I've read, even up to just last week, Americans are running at an unprecedented level of stress in their lives. And there's absolutely no suggestions for how to deal with it other than straight business products. And I've made a list of some of the business products that are now available to help you with your stress, ostensibly so. Beer and wine companies are inviting you to just relax with their products. There are just an amazing number of these miracle elixirs that you're supposed to buy. There are trinkets, calming bracelets, stress ball gumdrops, 
stress relief capsules, sleep aids, potions, tinctures, and my favorite, moon pals. And if you don't know what a moon pal is, well, these are the, the, the plush toy animals with big, doleful eyes guaranteed to help you get into a deeper sleep. Well, let's just get away from all these business products. Let's take a, a closer look at ourselves. There's a lot going on, isn't there? For which a, a $50 calming bracelet may not really hit the mark. What are you doing that restores a depleted source within? You know, the, what are you doing for the, the, the wellsprings, the in, internal wellsprings that nurture us? We need to be fed, don't we? We need to be replenished a lot more than just holding on to a, a moon pal. Now, personally, I, I remember feeling really parched inside at the age of 44. It was a combination of burnout, stress, my internal springs just dried up. And so on my first sabbatical leave from this church, I registered for a Buddhist retreat center in West Barrington, Vermont. I could never find that place again if I tried, but it felt so good and so right because it was far away. And I felt I just, I just needed to get away. Now, I knew about Buddhism academically. I could preach about it. In fact, I did preach about it. But I never practiced it. I thought, I thought maybe it could help me feel a, a deeper sense of myself, uh, perhaps offer a, a deeper understanding or framework or appreciation for life itself. I, I didn't know the word mindful back then. So there I was at a Tibetan retreat center for eight days. It sounds kind of brutal. By day two, I was meditating for eight hours. But you got to put it in perspective. It was three hours after breakfast, three hours after lunch, two hours after dinner. And all of us who were assembled there at the retreat center were given meditation instructors who would from time to time tap us on the shoulder during meditation. We'd go to her or his office and discuss how things were going. I had not your usual meditation instructor, I had the director himself of the entire uh, retreat center. He was probably so excited when he saw in the registration form that there was going to be a Unitarian minister in his midst, and he wanted to handle that. And so what was so, so fascinating was that, you know, if you can imagine, you've got Unitarianism, which is talk, 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 and Buddhism, which is be. B, B. And so there we were. Talk, 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 talk. B, B. Talk, talk, B. Talk, B. It's, it's so hard. B, B. But, but, but my mind just goes in a million different directions. Mm -hmm. Monkey mind. B, B. Talk, be, just be, hmm. be, be, be. I still sit as my practice after all these years. Yeah, it is my spiritual practice. From 1999 to 2008, I served on a committee for the UUA. I was part of a panel that had to interview every single theological student from Denver on west, interview them somewhere between the very end of their first year and the beginning of their second year 
in order to determine if they were indeed ministerial material in order for them not to continue through seminary, waste their, waste their money and their time knowing that they wouldn't do well when they were up for their, for their credentialing. And so we took so many things into account, we as a panel, as we interviewed um, the theological student. And one of the questions which we always, always asked was, what is your spiritual practice? And most of them did have a spiritual practice, and some were extraordinary. I mean, there are, there are as many different spiritual practices as, as there are stars in the heavens. For those who said, oh, no, I, I don't have a spiritual practice, wow, a red flag went up. And uh, we started to, um, well, consult, intercede, intervene quite seriously and made some strong recommendations so that they would indeed get involved in a spiritual practice. After all, these were going to be spiritual leaders of congregations and they needed to have a, a source that would feed the wellsprings within, something I had failed to do at the very beginning of my ministry, learning how important that was. And then I began to realize, why should just ministers worry about spiritual practice? It's, it's so important for, for every single one of us. It takes us to, to places where we can, we can really live more purposefully, deliberately, reflectively, and again, that word, mindfully. It restores us, you know, it's not an antidote to stress. The point of a spiritual practice is that now I'm, it's like popping a pill, I'm going to relieve my stress, I'm going to sit and meditate. That's not the point. It's a byproduct because you get really stronger in who you are and those inner springs are fed. Very, very important consideration. So if you are running on empty right now, let me ask you, what is your spiritual practice? So be it. doing friends I mean really how are you coping in these times most days I'm managing pretty well staying busy helps and there's so much going on at church these days small group ministry preparing for weekly worship organizing classes and of course there's lots of social justice organizing going on right now so there's plenty for me to do and keeping busy helps me maintain my equilibrium in times of stress. But I'm only human, and there are moments 
when the trouble of the world overtakes me. The world is heaving with suffering right now, and it's been a long time since my capacity was stretched so thin. What about you? Are you experiencing that as well? As soon as we wake up in the morning, our phones start ringing with notifications, more civil unrest, another person shot by police. How many new cases of the virus have been detected? How many more people have died? What new threat to our democracy is splashing across the headlines? What new conspiracy theory is gaining traction? Our society thrashes with anxiety and deep uncertainty. And sometimes we wonder if we even recognize our own country. Now, any of this would be enough for anyone to deal with, but it's not all, is it? We also have the stress of daily living during a pandemic to manage, as if the world weren't falling apart right outside our door. We step out for perhaps our one weekly trip in public and bring with us our necessary supplies, keys, phone, wallet, hand sanitizer, and don't forget your mask. A trip to the grocery store or the doctor's office feels both like a rare treat and fraught with peril at the same time. Some of us go to work every day, unsure of how risky it will be. And don't get me started on whether the kids ought to be back in school or not. And meanwhile, what can we really do about racism, fascism, the economy, from our living rooms. And by the way, we haven't seen our friends in months. We miss one another so much, and it hurts. What we're going through is real. It's not your imagination. The pain is real. The grief is real. And it's affecting our mental health. A CDC study recently showed that 40% of adults in the U.S. found themselves struggling with serious anxiety or substance abuse. And the problem is worst for younger adults who don't always have social structures and financial security to keep them afloat. We can't think or talk our way out of circumstances like these Grief, anxiety, and pain are not rational. There's no amount of thinking that helps us make sense of what our hearts have to say. And that's why, even though we let ourselves spend hours scrolling, on, scrolling through news articles on Facebook or on our social media apps, we don't feel any relief from having more and more information if anything, the information overload is making it all worse. Cooking and eating, exercising, shopping online. We've tried it all, but they barely help us cope. And coping is not the same as living. We need a different set of skills for the living of these days. We need skills for building resilience courage and equanimity. We need to know how to be still, how to quiet our minds and bodies, how to be still in our solitude and alone in our stillness. We need to know how to hear what our feelings are telling us instead of swallowing them or bottling them up when they become inconvenient or threatening. We need to know how to make real connections with other people, even if they must be maintained virtually, and not settle for superficiality. We need to know how to connect across difference, how not to dehumanize our neighbors who think differently than we do, even as we take our stands against hate or intolerance. We need advanced skills for being human. And developing these skills takes practice. It means diving deeper and deeper into who we are as people, discovering 
our hidden depths in all that we are, our goodness, our ignorance, our prejudices as well as our inherent dignity. It means being awkward with other people, taking risks in relationships as we learn to speak truth in love. Across generations and cultures, people have turned to spiritual practices to explore these depths of human experience. Sometimes Unitarian Universalists and other humanists can be suspicious of spiritual practices. Our fear may be that they lean on the supernatural or superstitious, that they require us to leave rational thinking behind in pursuit of what cannot be proven or controlled. Many of us do not believe in God, and so we might be forgiven for thinking that if there is no God, then there's no need for spirituality. And of course, many of us were raised in religious traditions that manipulated us through what we were told were spiritual means. But true spirituality is both simpler and much more complicated than that. Spirituality simply means the realm of the human spirit. Virtually all human beings journey through this world asking big questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? What's my purpose in life? What happens when I die? And does it matter? What is my responsibility to myself and to my fellow human beings? What sort of a world do I want to live in, and how can I make it a reality? These questions are all too easy to set aside when life gets busy, and especially when it gets stressful. But in times like these, when all of us are facing disaster together, these questions can suddenly erupt on the surface of our minds and plant themselves right in our way. If we aren't in a habit of turning these questions over regularly, they become roadblocks that we can't get around, and they can become spiritual crises. So it's good for us to have regular spiritual practices where we set aside time each day for contemplation and introspection. The great religions of the world, the ones from which we draw wisdom in our six UU sources, have developed many familiar spiritual technologies for doing this work. Prayer, meditation, scripture reading, almsgiving, dietary restrictions, pilgrimage, and many, many more. They all have two things in common. First, their primary aim is spiritual. The practices may have lots of wonderful benefits, for example, it's well known that meditation slows the heart rate and regulates the breathing. And religious people who choose not to eat meat know the benefits to both body and planet. But their primary purpose is not to get healthy, it's to get closer to the source of ultimate concern. So your morning jog might help you be nicer to your family members, but it's not spiritual practice unless it's helping you figure out why you're being hard to get along with in the first place. And the second qualifying characteristic of a spiritual practice is that it takes practice. Any musician will tell you that playing a piece of music through one time is not practice. The practice comes when you stop at a passage that's hard to play or sing, and you would shed it until you can do it perfectly. And that's the goal of spiritual practice as well. Practice is not meant to be easy. It should make us feel uncomfortable, like growing into a new skin. Likewise, good spiritual practice is something we keep coming back to, even when it feels like it may be getting us nowhere. I'm thinking of a meditator who sits on the cushion every morning for 20 minutes without fail, even if she yawns through most of it. I'm thinking of a mom who guides her kids through goodnight prayers, even as she's mentally calculating the family budget in the back of her mind while she's doing it. I'm thinking about the candle 
lit in the pre-dawn hours while the coffee is still brewing, the intention set for the day, no more than a few barely formed words on the tongue, or a donation to a cause you believe in, even if you're not sure how far five or ten dollars is really going to go. Through regular practice, we learn to slow down, to filter out what's not important, and to give what is important the due that it deserves. We notice more. We talk less and say more. We know what needs to be done, and we do it more often. We slow down enough to recognize the struggle of our neighbor, and our hearts are more easily moved to compassionate action because our own burdens don't seem quite so heavy. We notice our own humanity and that of others. So I invite you into a regular spiritual practice to hold you, to ground you, to remind you of what really matters during these times. The greatest gift that you can give yourself, the care that you deserve, is to know yourself deeply, to learn to love each other without reservations, and to have hope for this big, broken, complicated world. This is what I wish for you. May it be so. Amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us for worship this weekend, and we hope that we'll see you again next week. Our benediction today comes from the poet Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free. This week, I wish for each one of you the peace of wild things, the presence of still water, and the grace of the world. May you be well.